Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. The Outdoor Adventure Series celebrates individuals and families, businesses, and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration, stewardship, conservation, access, and enjoyment of the outdoors. We continue celebrating the National Marine Sanctuary's 50th year of ocean conservation and stewardship. The National Marine Sanctuary system is made up of 15 marine protected areas. Now, our guest today on the Outdoor Adventure Series is Tane Casserly, Research, Resource Protection, and Permitting Coordinator at the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary and Mallows Bay Potomac River National Marine Sanctuary. Tane is responsible for the development of programs to address commercial and recreational uses in and around the sanctuaries. Tane, it's a pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. You, uh, that was quite a mouthful you had to say about me, so I, I appreciate the kudos. Thank you. Oh, my God. You know, something. sometimes I wonder, like, I should just introduce you and let you kind of <laughs> deliver all of it. But it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to teach a new dog, uh, old dog, new tricks. I think that's what it is. But, uh, and I have to share, as I was prepping for the podcast today, and I was out on the websites, especially for the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary, I felt like I was back in school because whether it's elementary school, middle school, high school, we all learned about the Monitor and the Merrimack right. during the, the Civil War the, or prior to the onset of the Civil War. And so, so again, uh, you know, I have a feeling I'm going to be asking you lots of questions about the historical nature of the sanctuary and this, this iconic ship. And so, again, thank you. And how are you doing, by the way? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm really, I mean, I get excited to be able to talk about what we do as, as we all do. But, you know, like I said, the monitor is so iconic and it's such a, it's been such a symbol for, for 160 plus years that you can't get excited, get not get excited when you talk about what it was, its legacy and exciting things we're doing today. I think monitor is just as relevant today as it was back in the civil war in 1862. You know, what I, what I love about it is that it's out of the water. I mean, I remember, okay, it, there was a battle, it sank. And over the years, as I have been growing older, every once in a while, you hear a little news clipping, whether it's a paper or, or uh, uh, audio, video, media, TV, about something that's going on at related to the monitor. And I, and a, a conversation I hope we can talk more about is just how technology today is really helping to uncover or rediscover what it is we already knew about the ship or even the ships that are out on the, the Mallows Bay Potomac River Sanctuary. Uh, it just seems very interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, we look at how innovative Monitor was back when it was built. And we feel like it's our mission that we're charged to make it just as innovative today. The shipwreck is incredibly difficult to get to. So not only is it deep, 240 feet, so that's that's technical diving, which is in a whole added layer of complexity and training. But with the currents and the weather there, it's equally as hard. We've all seen the hurricanes have been coming up lately and storms. And there's two huge ocean currents that collide right over the shipwreck, the Labrador and Gulf Stream. So no matter... How much you try to get to it, you might have all the training in the world. Sometimes the weather and Mother Nature just says not today. So it's our job to bring the message to you, and that's using that cutting edge technology. So for our listeners, can you describe where out in the water? Let's start with the, the monitor. Where is it located? Yeah. Well, so the monitor that Battle of Hampton Roads occurred in the Chesapeake Bay. And Hampton Roads is that collection of the cities in the water there between Norfolk and Hampton and Newport News, that central area. The ship was actually traveling south, going towards Beaufort, North Carolina. I was being towed when it encountered a storm, and it sank in 1862, about 16 and a half miles off Cape Hatteras in about 240 feet of water. So it was being towed, and it sank. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plead ignorance. For some reason, mm -hmm. I was thinking it was in a battle with the with the Merrimack. So, oh, no. Well, 
so it, that that battle was a stalemate. Okay. Uh, so both both sides claim victory, but it did prove that that new technology of that rotating turret versus a casemate where all the guns are on one side. Right. That rotating turret that, that's that's the next step in naval warfare. But yeah, so it survived that, and it really went on for a few more months. It was in a couple little engagements here and there, but there was a new blockading effort that was going to be done off uh, South Carolina, so they needed to move it itself. And people don't realize Monitor wasn't really an ocean-going vessel. It was right. built specifically to work in the Chesapeake Bay at those shallow, calm waters. It was nearly a barge in the bottom of it, really. That bottom hole was flat, so you take that thing out into any kind of a sea state, it's not going to ride well. And also, it really was only 11 to 14 inches above the water line anyway. Okay. So you go out in the ocean on a nice day, you're going to get a little swell over the top. You go there when the seas are building 12, 15, 20 feet, you're not going to last all that long. So unfortunately, those events conspired against Monitor and it sank under tow. And that's okay. why it was being towed as well, because you think of it really like a barge with a big gun on it. What two okay. big guns are now, when it sank, and I know on this day and age, and, and I can remember from, the, and we're coming up in November, the Edmund Fitzgerald. I grew up in the Detroit suburbs, and I will always remember that. And I remember as we were learning more about it, or any other shipwreck for that matter, like the Titanic. And I know you have the Titanic. Uh, there's there's some interesting uh, backstory about that because you've been involved in some of that exploration. We're always learning about how it went down. And so how when the monitor sank, it it didn't just sink to the nicely to the bottom and it's the final resting place and the, the the souls that went down with it. It did something kind of unusual as it went down. Yeah. Well, and it was this the battle with the increasing storm went on for about a day, day and a half. And the crew fought as hard as they could against it. But again, remember that flat bottom, barely any above it, above is above the water level. So the water's coming in everywhere. So they're fighting it and fighting it as much as they can until eventually they have to raise the red signal lantern up to indicate to their ship, we need help. Ship's going down. We need to abandon. And it, there's a huge story even in that where the it was a side paddle wheeler, USS Rhode Island, that was towing it. And this huge sea state in pitch blackness having to send a rowboat back and forth in these huge seas to try to, so it's a tale of heroism and it's crazy what happened to these poor guys that went down. But as it sinks, we believe it goes down by the stern, which is the end of the vessel, right. comes down, hits the bottom, crashes a couple of times. But what it does is that the turret falls off because it's held on by gravity, essentially. Then the rest of the hull falls on top. So when they were looking for the wreck back in the seventies and they, they believe they found it, they ever thought they would find a, a, a shipwreck with two pointy ends and a turret on top. And that's not what they found at all. And it threw them for a loop for months and months and months until one man, who was my old professor, Gordon Watts, who was also a um, the state of North Carolina's maritime archaeologist. He went on to East Carolina University, where I'm an alumnus. He said, hey, what happens if the ship's upside down? And then everything clicked, but it just, it wasn't that easy. We think, ah, oh, they found the shipwreck. Oh, we got it. Well. It's not, and sometimes X doesn't always mark the spot. It's funny. I, I, I want to go back and learn more about your background, and we're going to do that. I, I'm kind of, I, I feel like I'm deconstructing a dish, you know, and, but I read in, in some of the show notes, you actually did some diving in the turret. Yeah, I did. That was, um, well, that was back in 2002. We worked for okay. the U.S. Navy to okay. uh, recover portions of the wreck. And really the goal was to get that gun turret. But, you know, as we were excavating down in the turret, we knew there was material in there, the possibility of finding sailors, other other items. But we didn't expect was, is that the coal bunkers for Monitor, which were aligned on the outer hull, not the outer hull, excuse me, the uh, along either side of the vessel, sort of in the center, in the midships. What happened when the ship flipped upside down, those burst open and the contents, those coal bunkers, emptied into the turret. So we didn't expect that at all. So the weight factor changed tremendously. So we had to do an emergency excavation on top of everything else. And as we started getting through that coal to the softer sediments, sand and, and whatnot, one of the Navy divers said, hey, I think we found a human bone. Oh, and wow. it w went from there. So we slowly worked with the Navy. 
excavated the sediment around it. And then we would come in, there's a scuba diving team, which are NOAA technical divers and partners. We would go inside and actually, yeah, I would have to go inside the turret, but we also had our recovery structure on top of it, what we call the spider. So think of it, this giant eight-legged structure over the turret. And then I had to go in between that and document what we saw and map it precisely. But I'll never forget when I came in there, I had to take my fins off. I got my slate out, dive slate, pencils, got my lights on. And I turned it on for the first time in that darkness. And there are two fully exposed human skeletons articulated in front of me. And it took, it took my breath away because you realize how horribly those guys died. Right. They were in there, in that turret, waiting for rescue. It was December of 1862. It was pitch black. And they're just the two men there together. And the ship goes down and that hit me all at once. So not only is it, no one expects to see human remains and it's startling, but then the context of the event too, it was a powerful moment. And I'll never forget that. And that was 20 years ago. I, I can only imagine as a, as a, as a very skilled diver, I mean, you, you don't do what you just accomplished without having that skill and, I, I would imagine sometimes when you're diving, especially ar around wrecks, you never know what you're going to find. And uh, I, I, I can only imagine how you said it took your breath away there. I, and I'm curious, you said something the, about the Navy, and I, and I know they partner with NOAA uh, on a variety of sanctuary-related activities, especially when there are wrecks involved. You said they want they wanted to get the turret. Up. Why yeah. why was that the case? Well, it was. I mean, I should say this is a collective effort between NOAA, U.S. Navy, and the Mariners Museum and Park, which sure. is our flagship visitor center in Newport News, Virginia. But it was so that the decision was made to recover iconic pieces of monitor to preserve them for the American public for the betterment of our historic history to really save these iconic pieces of history that changed naval warfare forever. But so when they did some research back in the eighties, leading to the nineties, they discovered that monitor being an iron ship in salt water was corroding and happening at some parts in accelerated rate. So the question is, what do you do about it? Okay. So they looked at, do we recover the whole shipwreck? Well, that was unfeasible because the delicacy of the wreck and of course the expense, we've got to remember there's a huge price tag to these things. So they put a plan together and they presented it to Congress and they said, we think we have a plan working with the Navy and NOAA to recover those special pieces. What's important about the monitor? That gun turret. What's on top of the gun turret? The monitor's entire drivetrain, which was unique to that ship built by the, the monitor's designer, John Erickson. So they said, okay, this is an opportunity to get those unique, truly American pieces of engineering and naval history and bring them up and preserve them for perpetuity. So Congress approved it and we'll move forward. But that that's how that happened. And I think there's people who debate, should we have done that? It was the right thing. I think back when we did it, it was. Maybe these days, the way we can model, you know, photo modeling, 3D replicas and things, there might be other ways, but we preserved the first rotating gun turret that went into combat history of the world. That was a uniquely American innovation. And it's something we should take pride in, and, and it helps to celebrate the ship that saved the Union. Sure. When you are involved or your peers are involved or your partners are involved in this preservation, and I can't remember if it was on the, the website or it was one of the photos that Vernon, uh, your communications director, has shared with me, is there's some preservation activity going on. How, what kind of effort goes into preserving, obviously retrieving it, putting it someplace that it's safe and it's not going to continue to deteriorate because now it's out of its environment that it's known for however many years. What kind of effort goes into that preservation and how do you know when you're done with that work and now it's ready to be viewed by the public that come visit the uh, museum? Well, that's an excellent question. So it is a gigantic effort. So people don't realize that they go, oh, we did the project, we dove on Shipwreck X, we brought the stuff up, wow, we're done. You're not done at all. So to put it into context, 
we did the major artifact recoveries with pre-planning, of course, over four years from 1998 to 2002. That was four years. Now we are 20 years later. Those artifacts are still undergoing conservation. The turret is still undergoing conservation. The engine is, the skeg is, all these big pieces because they're so huge, they're so complex. There's not just one material. It's not just iron, not just copper, not just lead. It's not just wood material or rope. It's all of them together, rubber, all sorts of things. So really my hat's off to the Mariners Museum Park and their conservation team because they have brought in world-class experts to do that. And it's such a specialized field to do it. Um, and some of these things will be done soon. The turret might have another eight or 10 years, but we're hopeful that the two monitor Dahlgren guns, those gigantic guns uh, and their carriages could be done in the next two, three years. And what a wonderful way to interpret monitor and rolling those out and put them on an exhibit. I mean, that's, that's what monitor is known for the gun turret. Those are the guns. So we're hopeful to be able to roll some of these things out and really share them. But to, to also kind of address, how do you know when they're done? They're never done. So they're always require maintenance and upkeep and slight sort of little conservations here and there. And that's just the, 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 the name of the game with conservation. And that's another thing we always tell people and say, oh, why don't you bring it up or do this and the other? And you got to realize there's a price tag to that that goes on forever. It may not be the same at the end, the same price tag, but it's our responsibility to do it. And if you're to have a question, if you can't do it or can't pay for it, don't bring it up. Don't do it. Now we know where our tax dollars are are going. Yeah. Well, and that's also makes it a, a special charge, right? It is. It's public funds. Yeah. So you got to do it right. You have to do it right. And you have to make sure you share it and it makes sense and it's meaningful. And that's, that's part of our job. Sure. So let's shift if we can to Mallow's Bay because I, and the, the, the ghost ships, I thought I have in the full, full disclosure, I have never heard of Mallow's Bay and the ghost <laughs> ships. So I, I learned something new. I'm, I'm, I never knew before the series that they're national. I only one I never heard of was Key West. I knew there was sanctuary there, but it never registered with me that these are national marine sanctuaries, the nautical version of the national park. And so Mallow's Bay, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, there's so much history there, but primarily focused around these emergency fleet ships from World War I. Okay. So during the, the World War I, the U.S. didn't have a big enough fleet to help support those efforts over in Europe. The whole war was somewhere else. So we had to get our men and material over there somehow, but we didn't have that fleet. So one of the ideas was, in conjunction with being building steel ships, can we quickly produce these wooden hold steamships? that match sort of a template design so you could roll them out in really kind of a quick sort of Henry Ford-esque assembly line and get them out and get the material over there. So unfortunately, they weren't able to serve in the war because the war finished before they were all completed. But we had this huge collection there. So they were brought over to Malice Bay eventually and salvaged because they could still use the metals and things for, for other uses. But it's really interesting. So you look at that history, you're like, wow, that's that's fascinating, this connection. And then like, what are they doing now? And now that space is the most beautiful natural environment you could ever believe where everything's growing out of them now. They, they call them flower pots almost. And I didn't get it until I first went to Melville's Bay and paddled it. And then I was like, you know what? This is a very special place. But yeah, it's totally different. Totally different than the Keys or anywhere else. It's a river. Yeah, I, I was watching uh one of the the videos that was on as you get to the page there's there's a four minute video there and it's like and i saw a couple guys about my age going out there in their kayak i'm thinking she had a nice calm day i could do that and i i'm like i would love to do that yeah yeah i mean there's bald eagles there's ospreys it's great fishing it's just it's such a special quiet place so you, you can't help but you're immersed in the history because you're paddling right through it. But then when you look at that space around you too, it really is your sanctuary away from the everyday. It's kind of one of our phrases we have for it. It is a very special meditative place, and especially so close to the beltway, the beltway, right? It's one way to just put yourself back into nature again. And, and it's sort of the, the connectivity between history and nature, environment, and ecology all coming together. It is pretty special. You know, it's very unique. Oh, definitely. And I'm curious, 
comparing the monitor, which is out in the Chesapeake, Mallows Bay, which is very accessible from shore, and you have the ability to go out in the water, say kayaks, for example, the, is is that sanctuary and its use, the, the people that are going to go out and visit it, is that going to be different than the folks who want to go out or can they even go out to, to visit the monitor or is one more public use, the other one is more research and technical use? Yeah, well, it's a good question. Well, so the monitor and bay, it's far offshore off North Carolina. So um, okay. it's fantastic fishing out that way, but they are com really, I think the public interface is completely different. Yeah. So, so for, for Mallows Bay, you can go to this beautiful Mallows Bay Park right there. And that's sort of our gateway to the sanctuary. So you can exploit the park or you can actually take a kayak out and launch it there with a boat launch or fish, whatever you want. But it's it's easily accessible in shallow water, oftentimes that are pretty calm, right? So that's one audience you're going to get. And then you've got deep offshore oceanic. So it's really going to be the scuba diving community. There's technical divers and probably offshore fishermen too. But that's why, so our challenge is, if that's the only way to get to monitor the only people you're reaching, are you really being effective? Right. So our goal is, okay, we've got some fantastic partner visitor centers with our exhibitry and our artifacts, we have to drive people to those visitor centers to make sure they can understand and see our story. And it's like the North Carolina Aquarium at Roanoke Island. So we have a, a, a third to quarter scale monitor shipwreck and a sand tiger shark. I mean, who doesn't love that? The uh, graveyard of the Atlantic Museum, which is in Hatteras, which is right where we're offshore. That's another great venue where they're building a, a brand new exhibit, Marin Museum at the park, Hampton Roads Naval Museum, the U.S. Navy. So that's where we find success. But yeah, it's hard. It's a deep oceanic environment way offshore. And we've got a picture of the there behind you. Um, it's my pride and joy, of course, for our office. But it's, yeah, it's challenging. I love it. I love it. And I do appreciate the the, the nuance and the differences of one is is totally accessible to the public. The other one is... It, you have to want to go out there and spend some time out there. And, but I, and I do love the fact that you have these partners, these museums that are, 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 are in the, are in the, the vicinity uh, along the, along the, the Chesapeake and are able to provide that, that resource to the, to the public who, and you can share it. This is where your money's going. This is why this is important. And I mean, just the nautical history uh, on the East coast is just totally amazing. I'm curious about, you know, a lot of the technology that's going in. I mean, I, in some of the preparation work and getting ready for this interview, I learned about the this telepresence expedition uh, to the to the monitor and in VR, which I know as virtual reality. And I'm curious, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that and what what it, what's the experience going to be like? Yeah, well, again, it's it's our charge. If the public can't get to the sanctuary. We got to bring it to them. And that's what that telepresence expedition, expedition did. So we partnered with this fantastic group called the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. So that they're experts in telepresence, experts in building ROVs, which are uh, remotely operated vehicles for those robots that go down that are tethered to the ship. So they have the capability for us to go down and explore and monitor in real time with scientists calling in and being part of our, our panel of discussants. And we explored it together in real time with the public right along with us. That's what I found exciting because we haven't done a sustained expedition to monitor for about two decades. Oh, wow. right. So this is sustained time at that shipwreck. And often as we do these projects, we're like, we were in a control van with about four or five people. You're in there, you're seeing these amazing th things on the screen and you're like, oh, this is, oh my God. I'm, wow. But it sort of ends there, yeah. which I think it's a real shame. So when we're able to share that same level of excitement and bring people in so that they can watch the discoveries at the same we time, the same time we make them, like that's that's a special thing. That's showing value and what we can bring to the public. So yeah, it was it was incredible. I love it. Now I have to ask the and for our listeners, my background is the uh, is underwater. The shipwreck is 
in, in the photo, there's a, there's a fish. I can't tell how big it is or what it is. <laughs> doesn't look like a shark, but I could be wrong. But there is what looks like a uh, remote operated vehicle in that photo. Is that what that is? Yeah, exactly. And that fish by your hand is actually an amberjack. Amberjack. That's probably about three and a half feet long. And then, yeah, yeah that's one of the ROVs. Yeah, there you go. And that's one of the <laughs> ROVs back there. Okay. Um, and it was a two-body ROV system. So you had an ROV on the bottom and another one tethered right on top, sort of acting like a lighting chandelier and mm -hmm. having some more cameras. So we were able to get all these great angles. And we we really look and monitor now, like it's obviously it's a shipwreck and it's an ironclad, right. but when you really zoom in, it's this whole other world, this whole island of life. And yeah. you'd almost think you're on a, a exploit like a NASA expedition to Mars with sort of those landscapes, but you pull back and it it's an ironclad from the Civil War. I mean, it was it was fascinating. That's amazing. And we have a whole number of pictures that Vernon shared, and we're gonna put those up on our show notes. And some of those, I mean, if I didn't know there's a shipwreck, I would have thought there's a it's a reef. And because you had all this beautiful uh, growth out there and, and the fish, I, I love that. I do have to ask, what was it like for you when you went down in your first RO remote operated vehicle? Well, I'll give you two examples. So I'll give you an example of my first scuba dive on the shipwreck and my first ROV dive this summer. So my first scuba dive when I was a young grad student at East Carolina University in the Maritime Studies Program opportunity to dive the monitor and sort of course you're like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm in, I'm in. So we're there, we're excited. Early morning start, we're motoring out, we're there. People are checking the currents, pretty strong, but they're okay, we can still do it. So we all splash in the water together. We know our plan and we're going down and I'm the last person with four people going down and I'm looking and I'm feeling myself being pulled one way and pulled another way and then pulled in an opposite direction. And then I see a layer of black underneath me. And I watch one person disappear in it and the next, the next, and I watch my feet disappear and then I'm at 200 feet and it goes pitch black and I can't see anything. Oh boy. So, and then I feel people crawling over me back up the line. So we couldn't do it because it was a total blackout. Then jump to 2022 and um, we go down. It was a beautiful day. We come through the currents and things and it opens up and it's this beautiful blue and you're seeing what you're seeing behind you, this sort of endless landscape of the shipwreck and just loaded with sand and tiger sharks. And it was the most glorious thing ever, ever. It just puts a smile on your face. Well, that, that's a memory. It, it, it's up here in the head and it's going to be with you for the rest of your life. I love that. I love that. Through this work and, and the advent of this new technology and what's available, how are the museums and the sanctuaries helping to reach new and diverse audiences? Folks that, I mean, hey, I, I am, I'm in my 60s. Okay? I look like I'm in my 40s. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm excited just to have these interviews because I'm learning things I never knew existed. And I'm thinking about the the young, real young kids, the ones that are in elementary school, middle school, high school, and, and realizing there's a whole other world out there that I knew nothing about, and now I'm interested. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a good question. So one, obviously, go to the visitor centers, but what happens if you can't get them? What happens if you live in the West Coast or the Pacific or Europe or South America? How do you learn more about it? So we, again, we look to new technologies to be able to share that. So one of them was that telepresence project. And the other one were sort of those virtual reality, I don't know if I'd want to call it people and sometimes make an image of a computer design sort of a thing and it's not, but these VR 360 videos. So we've done one for Mallows Bay that was very successful. And we just did one for Monitor, which is a bit, bit of a more of a longer form one. But they essentially, during that telepresence expedition, we had on an extension arm, a camera with three lenses on it. Mm -hmm. And that captured that space moving through with the ROVs to tour around the shipwreck. So you take that out and process it. And now the video is a 360 encompassing sphere of you in that space as you move through the monitor shipwreck. So you could put on a pair of those Oculus virtual reality glasses, or you can get um, sort of a headset, put the phone in sort of a thing, and it splits the screen. But essentially you look at any direction and you're in 
at the rec site. You're, you're in the sanctuary looking in every direction and you're moving through it like you're swimming. So for us, it really breaks down those barriers when you create those products because you could be, um, maybe you're physically challenged. You've got a financial to you. Maybe it's for distance or whatever reason. So by, I think by tapping into those new technologies, that all gets wiped off the table and it really kind of levels everything out. But that that's the new, that's what we're excited to move into with these new, these new innovative ways of reaching the public. You know, I'm, I'm recalling as you're sharing this, a, a colleague who I help produce podcasts with, including this one, uh, is heavily ahead of me in terms of technology. And I know he was working on a, a VR project and they were taking these headsets into like senior citizen homes. And I'm thinking as you were chatting, veterans homes, especially like armed services, the Naval, the Marines going in there, here's a, here's some virtual reality headsets. And now you can come and look at the monitor or, you know, other shipwrecks, wherever they might be. I think that'd be really cool. And it would really give a lot of joy back to them, I would imagine. Yeah. Well, you know, like you said, everybody knows the monitor, right? If you had to go to high school in the United States and they talked about the Civil War, invariably that topic came up. So we need to tell people it's a shipwreck and that's another hook to bring people in. And then you show them those innovative waves. Yeah, it's amazing. And again, I, you know, whether you're, whether you're a little kid or you're a grandfather coming through and you experience that and you see that joy on their face, that they're put into some place that really no one's ever able to go to. And that history, yeah, it's a special thing, but that that's what we do. So we, we have events where we'll have those headsets available. You know, we work with school groups where they're doing sort of shoreline restorations. We'll talk about the shipwreck as a reef. And here's a perfect example that the, the fish are so thick on the shipwreck. Sometimes it's hard to see the wreck and that's great. Yeah. Right. That's wonderful. That's what we want to see. So yeah, no, it's, but again, you have to think out of the box. You can't just do the same old way of doing and interpreting. I'll always try to be relevant. And that's part of our mission. I love it. You know, you, this part of your answer was a, another topic I, I was kind of curious about is the, the habitat that is, has been created because of the monitor or because of uh, Mallows Bay. I mean, you've got the, you know, Mallows Bay, you have the, the shipwrecks, they, you, they were burned down to the water line and the retrieved the, 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 the equipment, the mineral, the, the, the iron, et cetera. Things, yeah. Right, things right. like that. How is the, 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 the conservation aspect, the habitat aspect, how is that being developed as a result of both of these locales and these sanctuaries? What's that impact? Yeah. Well, again, I mean, so I should say up front, like fisheries management, we don't do that. That's not our responsibility. It's just the right. shipwreck. But I think it's important to really look at when we look at weather and climate things happening today, these wrecks are early indicators of change. Mm -hmm. So if you go down and say you love scuba diving, you're on the monitor and it's all these soft corals and it's orange and pinks and purples. And you're like, wow, this is amazing. And you go back two years later and it's all bleached out white, something terrible has happened. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, that's a great indicator of like, well, what did happen? Well, let's look at that. Maybe it's ocean acidification, a change in the pH, oxygenation, all these different topics that are such hot topics today that are being researched. That's the way I find that we can really use these wrecks to tell those stories. But the other thing, especially a monitor, the sand out there is a desert environment. It's just sand. So all the marine life congregate at the, the, the wrecks. These wrecks became living reefs. So when you look at that, and then you see what a critical role they start playing in the food web and the ecosystem. And I mean, I, if you're a fisherman or any fisherman out there, you all know that wrecks are great spots to fish, right? That's a known thing, but why? So we were able to work with some partners like the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, another no office, and we would multi-beam sonar the shipwreck. So we get this wonderful 3D image of the shipwreck. It looks great. We love it. Archaeologists, we dork out over it. But what this other group does is they'll 3D image the schools of fish around it. So now you can see those huge density of schools of fish around the wrecks, and it's only happening at the wrecks. It might be happening at some of the natural sites, but the density and these propensity for the fish there is incredible. And telling that story is really important. We want people to fish. Recreational fishing, charter fishing is incredibly important to the economy. And our wrecks are part of that story. 
We just want you to do it responsibly, of course. But yeah, so that all sort of feeds into it. When it goes to like ecosystem health, habitat, maybe there's some critical fish that are using that as a place to live. When they're bringing in desirable fish like Mahi Mahi or something else. Great. Let's tell that story. I love it. I have to ask, we had uh, Matt McIntosh on the the show uh, a couple episodes back, and he had this wonderful infographic about the the decaying of a a whale out in uh, back whale national marine sanctuary and everything that this decaying whale did for the habitat around i'm curious if he's done a, an infographic for you guys on the monitor because i i think it'd be kind of cool to see at every level what ha what what what's there the the plant life the that's that has grown around the monitor as well as as the fish yeah, well, we had talked about that with him. It's funny you bring that up. So we we had talked about something him creating what's called a site formation process, which is showing how the wreck changes over time. Right. But yeah, it feeds right into that with all those different schools of fish. So yeah, so we're definitely thinking along those same lines because it's important and it's a pretty cool graphic. Yeah, I think it would be. I think I would yeah. be. So I would love to, if we can, I think it's a good segue to learn a little bit more about you and your background. Like, uh, I know you were part of the, you came from the, the South Pacific culture in New Zealand, the Maori. Mm -hmm. And tell us more about that influence to you in terms of coming into this profession that you're in, which is totally amazing, by the way. Every time I have an interview with you guys, I, I leave being extremely envious. So <laughs> tell us a little bit more about your background. Yeah, yeah, by all means. And I should say, first and foremost, that I am very privileged to work for the sanctuaries in NOAA. Like, this is not a career path I had thought about at age 12. So, <laughs> no, I was going to be a chef and then I was going to be a marine biologist. <laughs> okay. um, my family is from uh, Aotearoa, which is uh, the Maori word for uh, over New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 that has always shaped me in terms of that indigenous aspect. But, you know, I, I, I grew up a little bit in California and then I was really raised in Maui in Hawaii. Okay. So learning about- There are the worse places to be raised, by the <laughs> way, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was wonderful. I'll, I'll say that. It's very special. Okay. But, but, you know, you learn about Hawaiian culture and the Hawaiian way they treat the land and the ocean and family and these things. It's really helped shape me growing up. And I, I was trying to find my way in college. I went to the uh, University of Hawaii at Manoa. Tried to find my way and I was a psychology major. Realized at the end that was not for me. I made a tremendous mistake for myself. <laughs> I went to chef school for a little bit, and then I wanted to go back to graduate school and um, started using Hawaiian archaeology. And, and I took classes in that. I was like, I was just fascinated by the Hawaiian heia of the temple, the history, the villages, how things were built. And I always loved scuba diving because it's quite easy to dive in Hawaii. Um, again, it's, it's paradise. And I, my professor at um, University of Hawaii said, well, hey, I know you I know you love to scuba dive and you've been interested in these field schools. We have an underwater archaeology program we just started. And of course, my response was, what's that? <laughs> and he said, well, <laughs> a few years ago, they found a Titanic and things of that nature and the, the documentation, the search for shipwrecks and talking about that history. That's underwater archaeology. I thought, well, yeah, that sounds great. I want to do that. So uh, it turns out I was very lucky that the guy who started that program, had just retired from East Carolina University, which is one of our nation's premier schools for this. He had just retired, went to Hawaii, started that program, as well as another future co-worker, who was my first professor, Hans von Tilburg, who was out in the Hawaiian Islands. And they introduced me to the field. And that's how I got to East Carolina. And I introduced to the monitor and sort of went from there. But it's a bit of a crooked path. But I will say that after going through that, maybe getting a bit of hindsight and being a bit older, you start realizing that it's not just about the shipwreck, right? That's exciting, but there's so much more to it. And that history is sometimes the tip of the iceberg and the real significance is what happens next. And that's where I find excitement. But yeah, it's been, it's, I, I can't say enough that I've been quite lucky and uh, hope to share it with more people. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and I, I'm curious about the, what happens next? What is, what's your next? Well, I'll tell you what. So we're pretty exciting for us is that 
We, you had mentioned at the start, we had the sanctuaries, Office of National Green Sanctuary's 50th anniversary birthdays, right. um, which was from 1972. Well, the monitor was the very first sanctuary, which right. we like to think is the jewel of the crown, as I will say to no end to anybody who will listen. But it's the first one. Right. And that was in 1975. So what we have coming up in 2023 is the 50th anniversary of Monitor's discovery. Okay. Took them a little bit, as I said, to kind of figure out what they were looking at. So the 2024 is the anniversary of them saying, hey, it is the Monitor. And 2025 is that 50th anniversary of our designation as the nation's first sanctuary. So for me, it's the ramp up to that and sharing and celebrating the history, not just Monitor's incredible historic legacy, again, the ship that saved the union, but Let's talk about that cutting edge science that we're doing now at Monitor and how that can inspire the next generation. And that's what I'm really passionate about now is, again, what next? It can't be a one-off, right? When we do any of these things that we have to think about this connective tissues, like how does it benefit our communities, right? What does that mean? Why should a community in Hampton Roads, where I am, or down in North Carolina, where the shipwreck is, why should they care about Monitor? And it's some of these, what happens next? threads, I think is what really makes a difference. Excellent. Excellent. Before we head out, there are a couple of segments we have in our, uh, uh, our show. One of them is called the aha moment. And I think it's a perfect segue because you just spoke about how do we take this, th this resource that we have in both of these sanctuaries and not only to excite and educate, but also to, I'm going to let you finish <laughs> what, what the aha moment is. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, it, it comes back to some of those, those 360 videos and those VRs capabilities. But when you have a subject like ours, when you're able to excite an eight-year-old or an 80-year-old by putting that on those headset and being immersed in that place, that very special place. And you see the joy on their face as they're doing it. They're doing this, they're doing that. And you see a smile. And then when they're done, the heads that comes off and they're just smiling, right? They're just smiling to be part of this, this story and that process. And for me, you, you get the little kids and you get the grandparents. You've got them hooked, man. And that's, that's the important part. And from there, you're like, okay, now how can we inspire that? This little kid now, I've brought into our story and inspired him. Maybe he's taking that home and he's thinking about the monitor and the civil war, but maybe he's also thinking, hey, can I see myself standing where those guys were who gave me the goggles? Can I, how can I be part of that story? How can I be that person on the ship telling that story? How can I support this? And that's, that's what excites me now. I love that. I love that. And I'm, I'm actually thinking I, I need to go and I've, I've never researched VR headsets before. I probably need to do that now. If I were, or if we were to suggest that listeners go out wherever it is you want to buy your technology from, can they actually have their headset and take advantage of seeing what you guys have created? Yeah. Well, the, the beauty is, is that all the, the National Marine Sanctuary has, has produced several of these 360 videos. So they're all on the National Office of National Marine Sanctuary's website, I which I encourage that. everybody to go to. They're also on the Malice Bay website, but they're free downloads. So download it for free. It's a public resource. And when you do, it links you to either there, you can upload that to whatever your system is or a phone too can do it. Or it can bop you over to YouTube where they're also hosted. You could push one of the buttons on YouTube and it breaks it into two screens and you put it into like a 15 to $20 little headset holder. And now you're watching for essentially 15 to 20 bucks at home. I it doesn't love have that. to I, be the high end thing. I, I know what I'm going to be doing uh, over the... Uh... Over the holidays, instead of trying to catch up on the Marvel universe, who cares? <laughs> I'm going to get educated. Before we uh, now head out, any final insight that you would like to share with our listeners? Could be a book, a quote, something that has really kind of driven you and, and helped to make you who you are and what you're giving and want to give back to the people you're having an impact on. Yeah, well, I think I just watched a film, a documentary on Netflix called Descended, and it really is special. It goes along with some of these themes of the film, some things I talked about today as well, but it's really looking at the discovery of the slave ship uh, Clotilda of Mobile, Alabama. So part of it is talking about 
the search for that ship and the impacts after its discovery. And the other part is about this whole community of people that were brought over on that slave ship. And it's just fascinating to see two different spheres. I mean, traditionally, you have folks that look like me that go off and find these wrecks and come into these communities from outside, but we don't really understand the impact of that story and what it might mean to that community in the sense that maybe the story really isn't about that shipwreck. Maybe it's about what comes from that shipwreck or the greater story behind it of what that shipwreck caused back in the Civil War. But just to keep those nuances open and keep your, your mind open and to listen to some of these other perspectives, when we talk about history, no matter what it is, I think it's really important. Okay. You know what I mean? Just we, There's different ways of looking at the subject matter that we might not initially see. And I think that's important to have an open mind. Fantastic. We appreciate that. Now, if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, uh, and, and we've kind of alluded to obviously the National Marine Sanctuary's website, but you know, given your sphere, what you're doing, where where would you suggest our listeners go out and have a visit? Yeah, well, first I would point everybody to the um, National Marine Sanctuary's website. So that's Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. You can do a Google search for that, as well as the Malibu Bay and Potomac River National Marine Sanctuary to learn more. But also look at our partners too. They're they're are really our visitor centers and the way to go to really be immersed in the history. And that would be the Mariners Museum and Park in Newport News, Virginia. Talk about the conservation, the USS Monitor Center. Huge exhibit. We've got a full-scale monitor replica in front there. I mean, you could walk through, you could see the gun turret doing conservation, all sorts of things. So yeah, there's all sorts of things too. You learn about all the partners we have and things we're doing on these websites. But yeah, it's really just embrace, learn. We're here to hopefully reach that next generation and inspire folks to inspire change. Fantastic. Well, Tane, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. And again, to be able to help you and and your peers celebrate the, the 50th year of the National Marine Sanctuaries. It's been fascinating. And it, for me, it's been a gift because I'm I, every time I chat with you and your peers, I'm learning something new every day, every time. So thank you so much. Oh, it's been an honor, Howard. Uh, thank you for having me. Fantastic. Listen, stay in a line. We're going to do a quick close and then you and I can have a final chat. Okay. Thanks. All right. Okay, folks. Uh, we've just been chatting about the, again, the National Marine Sanctuaries and really this, this wonderful resource, the system of 15 uh, marine uh, protected areas. And today we had the pleasure of visiting with Tane Casserly, research resource protection and permitting coordinator at the National Marine Sanctuaries, the site of the Monitor National Marine Sanctuaries and the Mallows Bay Potomac River National Marine Sanctuaries. And I have to tell you, once you see some of the pictures we're going to share on our show notes on the website, and, and you're going to be amazed and you're going to want to go out to both of their websites, as well as to the Mariners Museum and Park, their website, and just so many resources for you to consume. This is the wonderful history that is really at your fingertips or within eyesight. So do go out and do that. Now we're going to provide links back to each one of the, the sanctuary sites. We're going to provide some links back to some of the media and resources uh, that Tane shared with us. And also make sure you, you pay a visit on this episode. Let us know what you think. Share it with anybody you think is going to be interested in the National Marine Sanctuaries, especially the Monitor and, and the uh, in the Mallows Bay. Just wonderful places. And I, I felt, again, like I was back in school. And really love the, the aha moment and the insight to go. So whether you're eight or 80, there, there's something for everyone here. So do take advantage of it. Now, folks, you can listen to this episode on the Outdoor Adventure Series website, outdooradventureseries.com. We're also on LinkedIn and Facebook on those Outdoor Adventure Series pages. And we're going to have a Get to Know Tane uh, short on YouTube, which we'll have out a couple of days before we actually publish the podcast. And of course, you can consume, listen to, share, download this episode or any of our other episodes 
with the National Marine Sanctuaries, wherever you listen to your podcast. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day, and we will see you on a future episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Take care now.